It's been said that the first casualty of war is truth. Our guest today is a scholar and novelist who explores the power of storytelling, whether it's true or not, to shape public consciousness. He's Eric Bennett, this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University, alongside my co-host and friend G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. This week we're joined by a remarkably talented scholar and novelist whose work, whether for academic or popular audiences, traces the role of both narrative and truth in public life. Eric Bennett is the author of several books, including the novel, A Big Enough Lie. Eric, thank you so much for being with us. It's a thrill, thank you for having me. So a lot of your work, both as a scholar and as a novelist, falls squarely in the wheelhouse of, of story in the public square. And so I'm curious for you, what is the power of storytelling in American life today? So I'll, I'll answer that by talking um, about the novel, A Big Enough Lie, mm -hmm. and I want to say a little bit about the inspiration for it. Please. Um, it's uh, built as a novel on a contrast, and a contrast between two actual historical events. Uh, one, the James Fry publishing scandal, and the other, um, the rhetoric and falsifications that went into uh, the launching of the Iraq War. So for, for, for the audience that might not remember the James Fry scandal, could you just refresh folks' memories for that? Great, for sure. Um, in 2003, and it was April 15th, and I'll, I'll say why that matters in a minute, uh, Random House published A Million Little Pieces by James Fry. It was a memoir that gave an account of Fry's uh, altercations with law enforcement, trouble with drug use, and 87 days spent in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years later, it was picked up by Oprah. Her staff loved it, and then she loved it, and she featured uh, a million little pieces as part of her book club and had Fry on her show in October 2005. The memoir was cast as um, a tale of redemption. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Fry st struggles with this heavy duty stuff and he recovers from it, and any reader who has also experienced dark times uh, can, can come around and overcome, and so, so that, was, that was the pitch. Three months later, in January 2006, uh, the story starts to unravel. So a website called The Smoking Gun publishes the fact that most of cla uh, the claims that, not, not most, but many of the um, depictions in A Million Little Pieces uh, aren't borne out by public records. Right. And so the, the Fry story unra uh, unravels and Oprah features him again on her show January 2006. Um, and it's a kind of public shaming for these fabrications that betray Oprah and that betray any reader who looked to this memoir as, as a source um, or as a, as a kind of inspiring narrative of hardship uh, overcome. Mm -hmm. So that, that's half of what the novel's built on. Right. This idea of the outrage at somebody who fabricates a memoir. Um, the other half is, uh, and this is an image that do, J James Fry doesn't it, appear in the novel, uh, but this image does on May 1st, 2003, so two weeks after the appearance of A Million Little Pieces, George W. Bush lands in a fixed wing aircraft on the USS Abraham Lincoln. Um, first sitting president to make an arrested landing on an aircraft carrier. He uh, appears from the airplane in a flight suit, does a photo op with the pilot and with other service people on the ship. There's a change of costume and then he gives his uh, mission accomplished speech right. from the deck of this aircraft carrier. The famous image of that of course was widely circulated. Yeah. So yeah, people would know exactly what you're talking about. And it was recognized in the moment and afterward as, as a real piece of political pageantry. The aircraft carrier was 30 miles from shore, which mm -hmm. is a much cheaper helicopter flight than a plane flight. Right. Um, but there was an image to this, th this moment of a kind of military triumph. 
And in the speech that Bush gives at that moment, he declares the end of, of um, combat operations in Iraq. At that point, 104 Americans had given their lives to that war. And by January 2011, when um, hostilities were officially declared ended, another 3,424 had given their lives. So clearly, this was a premature declaration of cessation of conflict. Mm. The Bush administration definitely received flack for this moment, but it felt to me at the time and uh, in the research for the novel like a different kind of flack than the easier, clearer, more righteous indignation that the kind of flack that um, James Fry received from Oprah. So I, I wanted to write a novel that addressed this contrast mm -hmm. in, in um, le le levels of, of um, stigma. So, so what do you think accounts for that? You know, so, so in, in the James Fry case, as I remember it, it was almost like Oprah was personally offended and she expressed almost sort of the outrage of all the people who had followed her, read the book because she had had it part of her book club, um, which is a contrast with just sort of, you know, people sort of expect that uh, political leaders are going to make mistakes, right? Is, 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 that the, is that the juxtaposition or is there something else at play here? What interests me most as a storyteller, fiction writer, um, is the literary answer to that question. We can, we can take this conversation in the direction of truth and media and current events. Mm -hmm. um, as a literary matter, what, what I find interesting is how loath um, a large part of the American readership is um, to have fiction even in, in literary entertainments. And so clearly if a book is labeled a memoir, it should be true, but the difference in genre between that kind of memoir and a fictional account of a life is not so great, and presumably what a reader wants from it um, doesn't depend on the, the hard factuality of the person r writing that story. So I, I, the thing I'm, I'm most interested in is, is a kind of, um, diminishment of narrative storytelling as, as a place of accepted fiction. Um, uh, there's, there, there's a real autobiographical emphasis in American letters, and I think people were angry at Fry for betraying some kind of compact about giving us your true story mm. personally, and why that's more outrageous um, than a, a, a more public scandal is, is, is mysterious to me. And mystery is the province of, of good fiction, and so I was, I was trying to get at that in the novel. So you have these two um, sort of historic events. You have Fry and the fraud there, and by the way, that book earned the nickname A Million Little Lies right. as it was being exposed. And then you have Mission Accomplished. So two events, you're obviously observing current events. How did those two pieces begin to gel in your mind? And, and you can even give a chronology here if you want, into what became a great novel. Um. It's one thing to witness, it's another thing to write. The, the other piece of it for me was that I felt estranged from the national events that were going on. And I felt ethically as though I had a responsibility to try to think, try to read, try to feel my way into the experiences of American service people and also to think and read my way into the experiences of Iraqis and other people in the region affected by the war. So, so that, that was a strong impulse for me. I, I ended up dramatizing the story of a writer who fabricates an Iraq war memoir. And the novel contains both the fabricated memoir and the story, the rise and fall of this fabricator. And that means that I set myself the task of writing truly about Iraq. And I don't know if I did so or not. I did my best and read everything I could find to try and create what, what, read, what, what might read um, as, as a true Iraq War memoir. And then interwove that with episodes of, of how and why it got created. Where does the title of Big Enough Lie come from? Many people will recognize it as a quotation from uh, Goebbels. Mm -hmm. I encourage anybody who thinks that he or she recognizes it to, to Google around because you, you quickly find the rabbit hole that the internet is by trying to trace the origin of this idea of a big enough lie. Yeah. So Hitler in Mein Kampf talks about a big lie, a lie so big that people are incapable of doubting it. Yeah. And Hitler's use is 
he's arguing that Jews wrongly blamed Lufendorf for German defeat and that really it was Marxists and Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. And so he's accusing, uh, accusing Jewish people of telling a huge lie. Mm -hmm. Goebbels similarly accuses the British of telling a big lie in their account in 1941 of World War II. But there, there's a, a quotation ascribed to Goebbels that's all over the internet yeah. um, that people have trouble actually tracing to Goebbels. So I was interested in the phrase as this thing that even as it describes a phenomenon, falls victim to it. And I have, I have a couple of characters kind of hashing it out in a bar talking about a big enough lie. Well, Wayne and I have, have often quipped that, the, that lies are stories too. Right, that 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 there are there's 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 nonfiction, there's fiction, but lies are in and of themselves a, a form of storytelling, uh, and have a real they can have a real pernicious and powerful impact on public policy and public affairs and just the way we talk about things in this country. Welcome to 2016. Well, yeah, yeah, 2017. Yeah, um, I thought that in some ways the novel was really a meditation on the differences between uh, illusion and truth. Uh, was there was there a, was there a deeper message that you were trying to to give your your readers? Well, I, again, it was a way of, of throwing in my lot with illusion as a real source of meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and as as a novelist, there's uh, there's it's not incumbent on me um, to be strictly factual. Uh, it's I the joy assume, of being I, a I, novelist, right? Well, and and part of what's under attack among the many other things under attack by the current dispensation is that privilege for novelists. Mm -hmm. Because if everybody is spinning out um, kind of fantastic falsehoods, yeah. that's a real encroachment on my job. Yeah. Yeah. Or alternative facts is the case yeah. maybe. I want to get back to the lies again. Can you give any current examples, contemporary examples of lies that are accepted as truth by at least a certain number of people, if not many people? I mean, I, I guess there are probably many, but do any really leap out at you? You talked about 2016, and that was a presidential election year, and now we're into the first few weeks of the, the Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. Point to some examples of lies in this well, culture. I, I, I invite your help. The, 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 the one most immediately distressing to me is, is the allegations of voter fraud. Mm. Um, uh, just the, the whole backstory of the birther movement, the denial of, of Barack Obama's um, this legitimacy. Uh, I mean, I think there's there's one example that leaps to my mind is there was the the kerfuffle in the last uh, several weeks about uh, Kellyanne Conway mentioning uh, the the Bowling Green massacre, uh, a terrorist attack which did not happen. Uh, she has mis she has said that she misspoke, she mischaracterized it. But there's public policy polling. Uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago that said that by a margin of 51 to 23 uh, percent, Amer the American public believed that the president's immigration orders were justified by the Bowling Green massacre. Wow. So just the introduction oh, wow. of the phrase and yeah. just the introduction of the misstatement, if we want to give them the benefit of the doubt on that, has shaped the way we talk about these things in the and, public. And it begs a central question, which I think a novelist is probably well equipped to answer, which is why, what's going on in the mind of people who accept and believe lies or falsehoods or fake news or whatever. I mean, there, this isn't a question of, well, you know, we heard this and yeah, it's a lie and whatever. People actually embrace and take as truth what is clearly not truth. What's going on in the minds of people? It, does, it doesn't bring me pleasure even to mention his work, but having uh, looked at that passage of Mein Kampf, uh, Hitler's argument is that Everybody is capable of recognizing a little lie, but many people are um, just just assume that a lie of sufficient proportions uh, couldn't possibly be made up. Um, I feel like the domesticated form, and I, I don't. Um, I, I, I mention that as a historical curiosity and not as the source of my sense of thinking about this stuff. But but I, I feel like in, in other years, I especially remember during the the John Kerry election. Um, the domesticated form of that is is voters saying in a in a kind of knowing way, well, where there's smoke, there's fire. Right. And so as soon as it's out there, there's the sense that um, it wouldn't be out there unless there was some truth to it. This is Story in the Public Square. I'm Jim Lutis from Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island. You can follow me at JM Lutis on Twitter, alongside G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. He's at G. Wayne Miller. 
We're produced each week by the talented professionals at Rhode Island PBS. An audio version of our program can be heard two, four times each weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's The POTUS Channel, 124. We're talking with novelist and associate professor at Providence College, Eric Bennett, author of A Big Enough Lie. Eric. Talk to us a little bit about your craft. We hear a lot about writers talking about how uh, they write what they know, um, but you're not a journalist and you didn't go to war. So how did you do the research uh, that went into uh, this novel? I'm, I'm going to sound like I'm, I'm doing some dormitory philosophizing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. We welcome that here. But books are only made of words. and. Any book you read endows you with, with the experience that those words communicate. Mm. And if it, it communicates that experience successfully, then it's a successful book. And part of my aversion to the autobiographical emphasis is it takes away the idea that within the library, within the archive, we're free to roam across the centuries and all, kind of all spheres of human experience. Yeah. So, so part, of, part of the excitement for me and it was a solemn excitement, and it felt like a kind of civic uh, obligation, was to, again, I, I mentioned earlier, if, if I read uh, a veteran's account of the time that he spent in Iraq, if I read an uh, Iraqi archaeologist's account of the looting of the museum in Baghdad, to the extent that I can take that seriously, um, I've, I've communicated with that person. And so, so I wanted to see what I could do um, as an American citizen to bring myself um, cl closer, closer to this war by, by looking, looking at it in text. So I, I'm curious, you used the phrase there, your civic obligation. Uh, this, 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 your writing was an act of patriotism. I, I would call it so. Uh, it just, just it's excruciating uh, f for us to have um, such superficial relationship all the time to such heavy-duty news, mm. and to take each other seriously as human beings, we really have to think our way into to other points of view. And, and if all I do as a writer is say what it's like to be me, I'm, I'm not thinking my way into another point of view. Is that is that the critical role of the artist and the novelist? today? Should it be? M many people make that defense and I'm, I'm, I'm charmed by it uh, wh whether I fully believe it or not. But I know uh, uh, novelists from other periods uh, roam more freely. If you read Virginia Woolf, you don't just get the Virginia Woolf surrogate mm -hmm. character. You go into the mind of Mr. Ramsey or Charles Tansley. I mean, there, there's a, if you read William Faulkner, uh, he roves across a whole county and goes into all those mines. And this isn't uh, Shakespeare. I mean, it, yeah. um, some of the really heavy hitters got far outside of themselves and did so in a way that we still take meaning from. Um, so who are you writing for? which also then begs the larger question of who's reading today. And obviously the book publishing industry has undergone fundamental and revolutionary changes over the last 20 or so years. But starting with the first question, when you're writing, who are you writing for? Or do you not even have an audience in mind? I, I write out of gratitude to other people who have written books. And most of them are gone, but their voices remain. Uh, so it's, it's uh, Charles Dickens or Ralph Allison or Herman Melville, uh, Geoffrey Chaucer, that they've given me a gift. Um, and it's, it's one of the most meaningful things in my experience and to enter into a conversation that transcends any single human life um, is, is, is awe-inspiring. And I, I, don't, I don't feel as though I'm successfully talking to people who don't exist yet. Um, but I really do, the text outlasts any given life, and I think it should be thought about as, as a miraculous thing in that way. Are you compelled to write? Do you get up every day and say, I have to write something today? I, 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 don't, I don't write every day, but when I'm working on a project, it's all I think about, and so when I can find the time, it's what draws me to it. becomes to obsessive. It. Yeah. So one yeah. of the, um, so, so one of the, uh, you know, so you're, you're a, a multi-talented individual because you've had the success in, in publishing fiction, but you're also an accomplished scholar, and, and, you, and you've got another book, recent book, Workshops of Empire, and in it you write, to understand creative writing in America, even today, requires tracing its origins back to the apocalyptic fears and redemptive hopes that galvanized the post-war atmosphere. Tell us what, you're, tell us what that means. 
These days, if you want to get an advanced degree in creative writing, you have hundreds of options. That's a post-war phenomenon, and in 1945, there were just a few options uh, to study creative writing at the graduate level, and the main one was the Iowa Writers' Workshop, which remains influential even today. Mm -hmm. Paul Engel, who was a poet um, and became the director of that program in the 40s, envisioned it as a force for anti-communism. And his idea was he would invite writers from around the world to come to the United States and learn um, Western, European, and American ways of thinking about literature and find an audience and then return to their um, home countries and have a um, really affirmative view of the United States. And so he begins small, but, but this expands over the course of the 50s and 60s, where eventually by the 60s on Rockefeller Foundation and State Department money, he's traveling to the Philippines, traveling to Japan, traveling to Hong Kong, looking for the local poets and writers to send back to the United States and receive training in, in Iowa. It's a remarkable example of public diplomacy. At, absolutely. Let me circle back again to a question we started to get into before, and that is, who is reading books now? We, we have a, a culture and a society, not just in this country, but I would argue globally, at least certainly in, in many parts of the world, where the, uh, the competition for your attention is intense, whether you're looking at social media, whether you're looking at TV or film or whatever. But a lot of people are still reading. Who, who are the people, in your experience, who are still reading books? Besides us. Besides us, that's free, but I think it's probably hundreds of millions if you add it. So who are the other, you know, hundreds of millions? And why are they reading? Why are they reading books when you can, you know, read a 140 character tweet and say, next? So at every semester I teach 30 or 40 or 50 new students, and of those students, many uh, rent their books from the bookstore and return them at the end of the semester. Um, but a few each semester purchase their books and keep them to start a library or add to a library that they have. And one or two each semester cherishes with the same intensity the miracle that is literary writing um, that I cherish. And so if each professor in the country has one or two students who are that enthusiastic about it, that adds up to a lot of people. Um, that's anecdotal, that's, that's not a statistical answer to who's reading books in the United States. More statistical one, I think uh, many college-educated women tend to read mm. fiction um, as a smaller audience, audience for uh, f fiction among college-educated men. Um, you know, I'm curious, so we mentioned that you're an associate professor at Providence College. Um, how has your exploration of narrative, both as a scholar and as a novelist, shaped the way you teach? I, I like to be always awake to the, to the freshness um, of, of whatever I'm reading. And an undergraduate has only ever looked at this thing once. And I think one of the most important things as a professor is to try and see it as they see it in that initial moment. Um, since I teach a lot of recent fiction, one solution for me is always to be changing the course reading list. So, so often the texts are new for me as they are for the students. But there are also more canonical things that I end up having to teach fairly often. Um, but anything I can do to, to remember that, that my seventh time is somebody else's first time I, th I think is pretty crucial. This challenge faces professors so, everywhere. I'm going to borrow a page here from the New York Times Sunday Book Review which every week has a feature on authors, and it's sort of an intimate conversation. One of the questions they always ask, and it's very amusing sometimes and very edifying other times to see the answers, is what's on your night table right now oh. in terms of reading? It doesn't have, of course, you know, we're speaking metaphorically, but what have you set aside that you have to read? Uh, so I'm finishing a novel that has a, a fairly um, elaborate Chinese subplot and so I've been reading a great deal about China and enjoying it thoroughly. Evan Osnos um, has a great a kind of compilation of journalistic pieces he did, an ex expansion of it, talking about uh, peasants who become internet billionaires and um, the online dating scene in China, um, casino culture, all of that. So, His so father is Peter Osnos, who is one of the great 
book publishes, as you know. No, I, did, I, no I didn't know. Yeah, yeah Peter yeah. is his. So you're reading that. Uh, and, I'm, I, so, and I w was also turned on to Han Han, who is um, a Chinese novelist and also a sports car driver. He has an wow. on online following of a quarter billion. Um, wow. And I'll check that out. An author and a sports car enthusiast. I know, that's right, right up my alley. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm going to read this first. So there's only one uh, book of his work in translation. He has, he has kind of a slouchy Holden Caulfield um, uh, voice in his, his blog posts and fiction. Um, but I've been reading that just to see what um, young readers in China are geeking well, out about. What, what, what attracts you to a certain book? Is it, is it the author? Is it a topic? Is it, is it a genre? What, 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 what do you look for in a, in a book when you decide to read something new? Uh, I'm on omnivorous. Uh, I, if something fails to resemble anything else I've read recently, I'll often be attracted to that. So. Interesting. Um, Eric Bennett, we want to thank you for being with us today. We're unfortunately out of time. The book is a big enough lie, and uh, it's, a, it's a great read. The prologue will hook you. Uh, if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can visit us online at PellCenter.org or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. For Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis. Thank you for joining us.